Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, the second of our special installments courtesy of Speedo Australia, as we are speaking to today the world champion, Commonwealth champion and world record holder in the 200 metres breaststroke, Zach Stubblety Cook. Yeah, it was a great episode last time out. Um, I have to apologise, my microphone wasn't properly plugged in, so I do apologise. Uh, but it's definitely plugged in for this episode uh, as we speak to Zach, who, again, just like Elijah, has a fantastic outlook on swimming. Uh, and he does go into the fine details of technique and stroke rates and, and all that sort of stuff. So if you're a real swimming geek, you're going to really enjoy this one. Yes, so like Elijah, it's a little bit shorter than our usual episodes. So let's jump straight into the conversation with Zach's Double T Cook. So, Zach, you are Olympic champion, Commonwealth champion, world record holder. What's it like to hold all of those titles against your name? Oh, it's strange. I mean, like for me, it's been a whirlwind. Like all that happened for me in 12 months. It's like 12 months of the day yeah. was Olympic gold to Commonwealth gold. Um, and in between that was world championships and a world record. So for me, it was, it was strange um, is the word, first word that comes to mind and like it is still like imposter syndrome, I guess. Like I still just believe like I'm, I have that childlike wonder and enjoy pushing myself every day. It's never been about, you know, breaking world records, about getting the best out of myself and seeing how far I can push that. And that's continues to drive me now. <laughs> so it's not changed your outlook on the sport at all, really, with the achievements that have come up? Um, I mean, it's changed the outlook in that... I guess I've proved to myself that I can put a goal in place and, and, and move towards that goal and continue to move towards that goal even under pressure situations. I guess that's part of what some of those things represent. Um, but I think on top of that, what's more important now is for me, and it took me a while to get to this point, I'll be honest, like um, I was liberated by the experience, I guess. Um, you know, I got to the top of the mountain and something that I was very fortunate to do and worked hard to get there. So for me, whatever I do now is somewhat a bonus, um, which some people will find strange mindset to be in, but it's almost liberating in that no one can ever take an Olympic gold medal away from me, I guess. Does it come with any added pressure since having all those titles? I mean, yes and no. Like, I think you can feed into pressure how you want to feed into pressure. Um, I heard a story about Adam um, Petey, and he said, you know, what color is pressure? And, like, um, mm. like, and the coach who told me this story said, well, I don't know what color pressure is. And then you go, well, apparently he said, um, well, it doesn't exist. Like, you buy into it how you want to buy into it. Um, and I think sometimes that pressure is somewhat a privilege. We always say that, but I think you can buy into that pressure, how you want to buy into it and as much as you buy into it. And that is ultimately what like those high performance environments are about. Mm. I think it's important that you have both aspects that you're looking at things. So you say that you now know you can cope with pressure, but it's also those achievements have, like you said, liberated you. It's like freed up the pressure, even if more pressure comes. Does that make sense? Yeah, because it's, yeah, absolutely. It does make sense. It's it's weird though. Like it's a weird like concept mm. to kind of get your head around. And like the strangest thing is trying to explain it to people because the more pe like the further you climb into the sport and the higher you climb, the less people understand, um, which is a weird mm. thing as well. Like trying to explain it to someone that hasn't been on an Australian team, you're like, oh yeah, this, 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 this. Like, looking at you like you're speaking Spanish or something, just like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, like I definitely agree with that. Let's um, touch upon your trials performances then over the past, mm. what is two weeks ago now. So yeah. 100 breaststroke of 59 point, 200 breaststroke of 207. How would you rate your performances in Melbourne? I mean, at a 10, maybe a six or a seven. Um, I think like, you know, in Australia, 59 is a solid time globally, not so much. <laughs> um, and I'm fully aware of that. Like, I think Australia has a lot more to give in that 100 breast and a lot of room to move. Um, and obviously, Adam changing the game and the, two, uh, the 100 breaststroke um, has been really cool to watch and see. I think, like, I heavily relied on my back end a little bit too much in that race. Um, going 31 1, 
was kind of chasing my tail a bit um, in terms of like wanting to get out in front of that race and score fire for the relay on the team. But I think the 200, it was mixed. I think like having a big gap between the 100 and 200 was a mental challenge. Like Mm -hmm. it was, I wanted to wind down, but I also wanted to stay in that like space where I was hungry and keen to race. And I think I probably didn't balance it to the best of my ability and didn't necessarily get the best out of myself and almost reveled in that I wanted it too much like and had a bit more tension. I think like for me, the heat was probably a better put together race in terms of like the length and stroke count and everything. Um, but just not like I didn't change gear, if that makes sense. Like it was kind of all one pace. Um, and I was like, then I was like, oh, excited. But I think I just wanted too much out of that final. But for me, it was a weird meet. I'll be honest, like Melbourne was an interesting place. I won't say bad, but interesting place to have trials. Um, obviously, everyone had to adapt to that. Um, it just was what it was. But it was just a different, very different vibe to Adelaide. Like everyone loves racing in Adelaide. and Yeah. So what did you do between the 100 and 200 in your sort of downtime? What what do you do? Uh, I trained. <laughs> um, for me, like the <laughs> next day looks like a rest day. And the day after that, we try and hit some more 200 stuff um, and come back up a little bit in terms of mileage as well. Um, I'm lucky I'm a quick recoverer, I guess, or recover quickly from loads. So for me... I enjoy doing a few hundred efforts um, a couple of days out before 200. So I like that feeling of the turn, I guess, like that hypoxic, like really solid okay. feeling off a turn compared to like, I feel like I can do pace 50s a lot and just be like, yep, we'll just keep going. Um, but that 100 is a lot more challenging. Um, so I definitely try and do a bit of that in between and just some descent work, just get that length back in because, you know, I'm swimming on average, you know, 35 to... 42 rate in a 200 um, and in the 100, like I start at 47. <laughs> so like mm. um, it's a completely different stroke. Um, so yeah. Mm. It's interesting you talk about that because unlike other strokes, the 100 breaststroke and the 200 breaststroke are, they're worlds apart. Even just mm. stroke technique, they are very different. So how easy is it to transition? What is a world class? 200 meters breaststroke style stroke technique everything down to the 100 and try and sprint with these these big well they're gym rats they're, they're huge guys <laughs> in the 100 these days uh yeah i mean like i probably haven't done it yet to be fair like um commonwealth games is obviously like great but 59.5 is like solid um i would say and i think like i assume mm-hmm. a world-class back end but not necessarily that front end like i still struggle with that front end speed and mm-hmm. i think that's really the point of difference like 200 guys will chase efficiency all day like that's what we're trying to get so we can get the most out of that second hundred um or get the least amount of damage on the second hundred i guess um but the hundred guys are more yeah that front end speed and then maintaining that stroke the guys that maintain they're the ones that come out on top so for me like yeah changing down to the hundred i still haven't fully understood it like i often stand behind the blocks for the 100 and go yeah like I, I enjoy this race but i'm not entirely sure whereas before the 200 like i know where to change gears where to descend where to like lift the stroke where to change the stroke and where to build into the walls and like like i know the intricacies of it whereas the 100 i'm like okay well, like i don't know what's about to happen <laughs> <laughs> is is the 100 a personal target or is it more a relay target for you uh, a bit of both. I mean, for me, personal target, obviously, to help the 200. I think, like, to develop the 100 oh. is is a priority for that 200. I think, like, like my best last 50 of a 200 is 31.1. I'm like, there's not much room, like, to go, you know, 30.8 when that's the 100, mm. my best 100 back end. So it's like, there's not much room to move in that back end, whereas the front end is where things have to move. And that's, I guess, why there's been a focus on that 100 a bit more over the last eight months, I guess. Um, and definitely, like, gotten stronger in the gym and all that. And I think 
it's slowly transferring into the pool. Are you a swimmer that thrives off competition? Because, of course, a 200 breaststroke, you were very much racing by yourself, almost like a time trial. Do you need that to try and drive you on, especially at the front end, for example? Mm, yeah, I think I, I said this to a couple of journalists after the race. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't be where I am today without Matt. And, like, I'm very mm -hmm. candid about that. Like, we've pushed each other. Like, we've raced each other since we were 12 years old. And now we're both 24, 25. So, like, for the better half of our half our lives, we've raced each other. And, like, he's always pushed that front end. I've always pushed the back end. So, like, we've mm. always challenged each other in unique ways. And, like, I enjoy that and enjoy the race. And I think, um, obviously, like, you're always trying to run your own race. But having someone there to guide your pacing and guide your... I guess where you're at in that race um, is definitely helpful. Um, and like, yeah, I'll be honest, like sometimes it is, you're not necessarily chasing the clock. You're chasing, you are chasing like the person next to you to like stick with them or stay mm -hmm. behind them and, and push through them or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, like it definitely is better when there's more in the race. Um, that's why I, like, that's why I love yeah. racing in all places of Japan. Like, the Japanese breaststroke is mm. unbelievable. Um, you know, it's like yeah. world class, yeah. second to none. The fact that they've had, well, they're Australia and Australia and Japan are the only nations that have two two oh six swimmers in the world. Yeah, mm. yeah. When you look at how you race the two hundred breaststroke, you keep saying it's it's a back end speed. It's how you race the the final hundred, and you're renowned for almost overtaking the whole field in that last fifty meters. How risky of a business is that for you? Do you go in like fully or you've got like full analysis of the swimmers around you so you know you can't give them too much room and you can't save too much back? Or are you in your own goggles? Are you in your own head and just racing your own race? Yeah, I think I'm racing my own race. Um, if I'm honest, like it is like I get what like I've watched the Olympic final maybe like twice. And like, I get so nervous, partly because it's obviously the Olympic final and I look really calm and I'm like, what the fuck, like what, what, was, what headspace were they in there? <laughs> and, um, that's obviously part of it. And then, but like the other part of it is like, you know, I turn, I think it's sixth at the 150. Mm. Um, and I'm like, oh my God, like it's, it's actually not going to happen. Like everything I've thought about it not being real is, is, is true. <laughs> and you're just like watching it so i think like i am definitely trusting and backing myself in to to build through that third and fourth 50 um and although it looks like i overtake everyone it's more speed maintenance than descending if that makes sense i guess it's like yeah. the other relationship yeah. is like when you look at phelps and lochte's turns their turns didn't necessarily weren't they were very very fast but they were faster turners in the world, but they ascended their turns, whereas Phelps and Lockby often descended down. So, like, mm -hmm. it's also a matter of perspective, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, if we look forward... Uh, oh, sorry. If we look ahead to the World Championships, are you feeling confident that you're, you're going to win gold in the 200 breaststroke? Uh, I'm not sure. I think, like, it'll be an interesting meet. I think, like, I'm just excited to race again at that World Championships. Like, I think there's been quite a few fast swims this year. I think, like, obviously Nick Fink as well coming off, like, a solid World Championships mm -hmm. the end of last year. I think he's looking quite good. And then Leon swimming at 6'6", six, six, whether he'll swim it or not is another question. Um, but, you know, I'm prepared to race my best and whatever happens in my best. Obviously, like, World is important, but everything is kind of in the frame of next year too. I think, like, this year is the last kind of chance to not have a play, but um, refine those processes one more time. Mm. Is it ever about the time when you go into a meet like that? Um, yes and no. Obviously, like, you have to be swimming to a seven, to a six to you know make the final. Um, but mm. you you are right in that like when it does get to that like competitiveness, that like last point, it becomes less about time and more about um, execution of a process under pressure, which is racing <laughs> to me. Like mm. to me, that's what yeah. it is like ultimately. And the high performance is beating the person next to you. 
Yeah. I mean, we've read somewhere that you're a bit of a perfectionist, and to us, your world record swim was pretty much perfect. I mean, is there a way you can improve on it? I hope so. I, I think, like, I wouldn't be still swimming if I didn't think there was more in it. I think, for me, I think there's a lot more in it. And, like, obviously, seeing Adam take the 100 to a whole other realm to when he started is definitely, like, inspirational in that mm. regard. Like, seeing that and seeing someone believe in that is, is is inspiring and i think for me i definitely believe there's a lot more in the two breast um and i think like i wouldn't be swimming if i thought i had my perfect race and i think it's that like for me like the words i live by is like the relentless pursuit of like a perfect process and being ultimately accountable for that so for me like mm-hmm. more in my everyday training environment that's what it is like i try to get the best out of myself and push myself each and every day and get the best out of myself in that relentless pursuit of that perfect process. But then on top of that, I have to be ultimately accountable for that. Um, So for me, it's become less about coach driven and more towards athlete driven. And we work together as a more partnership now. It almost sounds like your outlook isn't actually about the achievement at the end because it'd be very easy to look at you've achieved pretty much everything that you you could conceivably achieve bar backing it up again but actually the way that you're staying motivated in the sport is process driven driven it's it's like motivation day by day rather than goal by goal Mm. yeah absolutely i think like it's almost too long between innings to be that like gold to gold i think like obviously i've had a quick run and quite an intense run in the last you know 18 24 months and with paris only around the corner it it is all about that process um and ultimately like we can talk about gold medals we can talk about commonwealth games we can talk about all those pressure environments and like winning but ultimately like in those environments the only thing that i could control was my process and that's all it's about like and, and I just have to be able to bring that back into, you know, my training environment. And like when the pressure comes, know that I'm confident within my processes to perform at my best on that day. And I think like it is interesting because it's not always like that. Like to your point, like with pressure, Dan, like you, like Commonwealth Games, 100 breaststroke, walking out before Adam. And then watching the whole crowd stand up for PD was like, <laughs> I like just looked at the pool and looked up at the stands and was like, okay, like, let's go, like, let's have fun. And it was just like, <laughs> it was a weird headspace to be in because I, obviously it wasn't my pet event, but it was like, it became an enjoyment. Like, and it was like, that pressure was like, fuck yeah, yeah like, when do I get these moments? And it was like a, mm-hmm. it was a strange feeling and only I've only ever had it a couple of times, but it's something that is still about that process, but you can like dial in that pressure sometimes. Yeah. I mean, Elijah said that he said that it's, it's all about soaking in that pressure and exp- just ex- the, the experience rather than the, the results is his mindset. Mm. And he's very much trying to soak it all in and take it all in his stride. So it's, it's, it's funny that you've got the same sort of mentality and it's all about enjoying mm. it rather than goal driven. Like Scott was saying. Yeah, it's um, I think like when you get to the top, as Elijah has as well at World Champs last year, like you realize that it is like it sounds so cliche, but it is about the journey. Like you remember the decade before, you have like mm-hmm. the gold medal at the Olympics is five minutes, like that's it, you know, like and then it's the next medal presentation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you come home and you have all the parades, you have like multiple like luncheons, functions, where everyone like wants to see the medal, wants to hear the story, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like everything around it you remember. And then like that moment, obviously you remember, but it's the fond memories that got you there, like the camps, the long times overseas, everything that got you to that point and like the friends that you made along the way. And I think, that lends itself to that mindset of the experience and the enjoyment as well while you're racing. Um, Mm -hmm. And like, I'll be honest, like I walked out for the Olympic final and the last thought I had before I got on the blocks was like, I looked down the pool and I saw like the Olympic rings where the podium was and there's like 
it would have been like 30 TV cameras in front of it. And I was just like, mm. how cool is this? Like, I'm in lane four in the Olympic final. Like, let's just go out there and enjoy this moment. Like, that was... And, like, obviously there was nerves and other mixed thoughts and feelings in the way, in, in that same headspace, but it was that excitement and enjoyment that, like, you never, like, rarely get these opportunities in your whole life and mm-hmm. rare for you get the opportunity as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That kind of that feels like a really natural place to kind of end the main discussion. We do usually finish with some quick fire questions, though. So, are you happy just to run through those before we finish? So, what is your favorite event in swimming? My favorite event to race is obviously the two breasts. I think my favorite event to watch is probably the men's for free at the moment. Oh, nice, nice. Who is your swimming idol? I think. Obviously, Phelps was when I was, you know, a young one. But I think, like, I got to I got to train with Brenton and Christian Springer towards the early end of uh, end of their career and the start of my swimming career. So, like, watching them on TV and then being able to train with them and watch, like, it was like three sessions, but I still remember it. I was like twelve years old and like it was awesome. So probably those two. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, what's your proudest moment in swimming so far? Uh, I think the Commonwealth Games gold because Commonwealth Games gold, not a quick answer, but it like kind of surmised everything for me. Like I was 15th at Gold Coast home Commonwealth Games and it kind of set me on the path to where I am today. Um, It was a big turning point. So definitely like that Commonwealth Games meant a lot to me. Um, That's probably like Mm. the most nervous I've been for a long time because I wanted it really bad. Um, But yeah. (laughs) Uh, what's the hardest set you've ever done in training? Oh. The, I've done. Oh, it's for, like a different. You want an aerobic hard session or like a heart rate hard session? Because I, I find them two very different hard, hard like <laughs> levels, I guess. Um, one of each then <laughs> the hardest aerobic session breaststroke i've done is like eight 200s and like i was a 216 swimmer at this point of view at this point mm. so uh, it was a descend descend short rest breaststroke 200 session so eight 200s descend from three minutes down to 240 on 240 and mm. like the last two on 240 and i was like this is PB plus like 15, 20. I was like, this is ridiculous. But mm. I did it. But like, that was very difficult. And the other one was... Oh, you made it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard, like there's a Belmonte set. It's like 36 100s blocks of eight and just descend the first three rounds. So descend uh, to like threshold slash max best average. And then the last one, mm. like removal. And my coach at the time was just like, oh, you and Gilly can do this breaststroke, but we'll just take off two. So six rounds, uh, four rounds of six breaststroke and six best average. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, neither of us did breaststroke for like the next couple of weeks because we both came up a bit sore. <laughs> but, yeah. Wow. Um, a final question. It gets to know you a little bit away from the swimming pool. So if you to go on a road trip, you, you've got three spaces in the car, you can take friends, family, so friends family or celebrities who would you take with you well i think i'd love to do a road trip in tassie with probably mac horton i'd love to take one of my best mates divi and from school and then i think and probably I'd like to get to know Cody a bit more too. Cody's a good guy. <laughs> nice. Nice. Was that? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to this week's podcast and um, best of luck this summer. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens at Worlds and beyond. It's, um, it's been a really like eye-opening chat to hear that all of these achievements and yet yeah, it's it's a very holistic outlook. It's not pressure-driven to like do these outcomes again. It's just enjoying the moment. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's been nice to chat to you guys and all the best. So Dan, fantastic two episodes. Thanks to Speedo Australia speaking to Zach Subti Cook and Elijah Winnington. Again, we've come away from the conversation with Zach looking at the mentality of swimming rather than mm-hmm. what happens in the pool. And it's it's about removing pressure and looking at the sport of swimming as a day-to-day achievement rather than a medal goal focus, which is something I know junior swimmers around the world can take a look at and take away and just say, am I enjoying my day-to-day in the pool? If I am, brilliant that will help me stay in and enjoy the sport for so much longer than winning a gold medal yeah he was very um, process driven wasn't he Mm -hmm. really process driven which i think is the right thing to do and that's probably the reason why he's got to the top of the mountain um which is really interesting and i love the story when he walked out to the olympic final lane four you look at the olympic rings and you think i've done it everything that i've worked hard for this is it. This is my moment. And he said that he didn't have much pressure. I'm sure he was nervous, like he probably said. Um, but it's about during the moments. This is what you've spent your whole life aiming to achieve. And you're there and you're doing it. Um, and of course, it's obviously went on to win gold and um, happily ever after. But uh, yes, yeah, a fantastic mindset to have. And both Elijah and Zach have very similar mindsets, I think. And maybe it's the same for across all Australian athletes. Who knows? I think what you find is these two guys... I think why we are finding the similarity is because these two guys have been right at the top of this sport. They have Mm. won medals on a world and Olympic stage and they both know the come down from that. So Mm. they like Elijah said that winning a medal lasts that, that feeling of euphoria is a minute. And Zach Sobdy cook said the medal presentation is five minutes. They both know that if you're relying on that moment in the sport, that's that's not going to last you very long. So again, we're we're very much repeating ourselves in this like reflection, but it's so important that people take away that swimming is so much more about the times. And like I'd go on a wider perspective as well. Like when we upload all of our reels and shorts that we do onto Instagram, onto YouTube, we very often get a comment with, "Well, what was the time?" I'm like, "It's Tom mm. Dean swimming a 100 freestyle heat in Edinburgh." The time is irrelevant. Just enjoy yeah. his technique. Enjoy the way he swims. Like, yes, the swimmers can change the way that they look at the sport, but also like fans, the way we view the sport, we can just enjoy what is a very nice swimming technique. Like, I feel like take the times away. <laughs> yeah, especially when you look at Zach, who's got a, I think, a near perfect breaststroke technique, especially with the, the distance of the 200. He said he struggles with the 100. Um, I just don't. Which it is, yeah. It's it's two different races, like you were saying. You look at the size of Adam, and then you look at the size of Zach, and they're two completely different people, you know, in terms of physiques. Um, but yeah, it, it it comes down to the same thing. I think we're going to go around in circles here, where it's just about enjoyment. It's it's enjoying the sports, enjoying the processes. As long as you enjoy it, then that's really all that matters, and hopefully the results come with it. But really, it's it's enjoyment. Yeah, absolutely. So that rounds up this week's episodes of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, courtesy of Speedo Australia. Like we said before, we are forever grateful with the connections that our partnership with Speedo is affording us in this sport of swimming. And hopefully everyone, yes, it's a this podcast is mainly a British audience and these are two Australians, but hopefully everyone can take away some vital lessons from two incredible swimmers in the sport. So if you haven't subscribed already, please do so to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And me and Dan will be back in one week's time as we continue our build up now to the World Championships in Japan. Yeah, it's very exciting times. Thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.